This is Israel broadcasting from Jerusalem. Ruven Morgan reporting. In just six hours from now, the President of Egypt, Anwar Sadat, accompanied by President Katsir and Prime Minister Begin, will be inspecting an Israeli Guard of Honor at Ben Gurion Airport. And all over the country, citizens watching their television sets, listening to their radios, will be rubbing their eyes in disbelief. And that was how the midday newsreel hit the airwaves on Saturday, November the 19th, 1977. A seemingly incredible headline. But we soon learned that in the Middle East, the impossible is done immediately. I'm standing on a grandstand built especially for 2,000 newsmen which are gathered here for the occasion and the Arab Republic of Egypt airliner has just come down. Here comes President Anwar Sadat coming down the steps and the crowd is greeting him as the official military band gives a fanfare. President Sadat stands on the steps of the plane dressed in a light gray suit waiting for the fanfare to finish before he comes down. Lined up in front of me, directly in front of me, members of the Israeli cabinet, the diplomatic corps, and the two rabbis, the two chief rabbis of Israel. The national anthem of the Arab Republic of Egypt, played here at Ben Gurion Airport by an Israeli military band, conducted by veteran conductor Major Graziani, and that is the first of the guns, the first of the 21 guns which will be fired here, the 21-gun salute reserved for heads of state. Lit up by the flares and lights in the background, I can see the smoke curling up into the sky from the guns. Security here at the airport is tight, tighter than I have ever seen it for any visiting personage. There are border policemen all over, their green berets flashing, it seems, in the flashlights. And behind me on the terminal roof, border police are mounting guard with machine guns at the ready, just in case there should be any interruption or any interference of the proceedings. This is the biggest news operation ever mounted in Israel. Some thousands of newsmen from all over the world. And now, the plaintive strains of Hatikva, the national anthem of the modern state of Israel, the hope. Perhaps in many ways, symbolized by this visit here, President Anwar Sadat of Egypt bringing with him a hope, a faint hope, a big hope, of peace. An end, perhaps, to a conflict which has existed for many generations. anthem draws to a close and President Sadat is now beginning to walk down the red carpet. Security men are completely surrounding President Sadat as he approaches Prime Minister Menachem Begin. Mr. Begin is smiling very very broadly as he talks to President Sadat. President Sadat himself looks a little stern doesn't see. Now he seems to be smiling, apparently with surprise at the sudden outburst of clapping as he approaches the stand. And he's now greeting Mr. Shamir, the speaker of the Israeli Knesset. Well, it's happened. After a week of hope, a week of suspense, President Sadat of Egypt has actually landed. This is Shimon Ayalon returning you to News Desk in Jerusalem. Yes, it had happened. How come? After almost 30 years of enmity. It began with what many thought was a game of bluff between two political grandmasters. We, the Israelis, stretch out our hand to you. It is not, as you know, a weak hand. If attacked, we shall always defend ourselves, as our fathers the Maccabees did, and won the day. From the start, it was a media event. Following President Sadat's dramatic statement in Cairo that he was prepared to go to the ends of the earth to talk directly with Israel, 
Prime Minister Begin broadcast directly to the people of Egypt. But we do not want any clashes with you. Let us say one to another, and let it be a silent oath by both peoples of Egypt and Israel. No more wars, no more bloodshed, and no more threats. Almost immediately, the forum switched from radio to satellite television. I'm just waiting for the proper invitation. Uh, you must uh, get something directly from Mr. Begin, not through the press. Right, right. I will, during the week, uh, ask my friend, the American ambassador uh, to Israel, to find out in Cairo uh, from his colleague, the American ambassador to Egypt, whether he will be uh, prepared to transmit uh, a letter uh, from me to President Sadat, inviting him formally and cordially to come to Jerusalem. Uh, that could be, say, uh, within a week? You can say that, yes. The extraordinary dialogue was carried out on the programs of US television newscaster Walter Cronkite. But the final act was here in Jerusalem when Prime Minister Begin made this momentous announcement. Yesterday in the afternoon, through the good offices of Ambassador Lewis, I got from uh, Vice President Mubarak a question whether it will be acceptable to us that President Sadat should arrive on Saturday night. And uh, we answered in the affirmative. Then the question was put to us at what time he should arrive so that it shouldn't be any desecration of Shabbat. And I replied, between 7.30 and 8 o'clock will be, from our point of view, the proper time. 20 minutes before 10 p.m., the seemingly impossible has happened. President Anwar Sadat of Egypt, a nation officially at war with Israel, has arrived here in the center of the capital of Israel. A historic moment. And if you can detect a note of emotion in my voice, it's an emotion that's shared by everyone here in the lobby of the King David Hotel, where President Sadat has just walked through the doors. He's walking down the red carpet. On his left, the flag of Egypt, the flag of Israel, on stands. With him, assistant hotel manager Avram Weiner. And you can hear the crowd here, the crowd of photographers, of pressmen, of US congressmen who are staying here, of hotel employees, and of selected guests, all of them applauding. President Sadat is now talking two members of the hotel staff making way, his way down the red carpet, the crowd being pushed back, smiling, waving at us, walking slowly by. Near close to him, Eli Ben Ali Saar, the head of the Prime Minister's office in the Prime Efron, the Director General of the Foreign Ministry, the two men who have been planning this visit, Cabinet Ministers following behind. Foreign Minister Moshe Dayan just walked in smiling happily. Mr. Evron, sir, Director General of the Foreign Ministry, how do you feel tonight after all the planning you've done? Of course, it's a very exciting uh, moment for all of us. And we just hope that everything will work out well. At the moment, you think that there is a hope for peace in the Middle East? There's always hope for peace in the Middle East. The moment is getting closer. How is working with the Egyptian advance party been? Have there been any problems or has it been fairly smooth sailing? There have been uh, no problems at all. It was as if we've known each other for a long time. After all, we've been neighbors for 4,000 years. In the hotel, things are beginning to relax a little now. The VIPs have gone in the elevators up to the sixth floor where President Sadat is staying in the royal suite. A bedroom, a living room, a dining room, a kitchenette, and a view of the old city of Jerusalem. So from the King David Hotel, the seen just a few moments ago of tremendous excitement, tremendous elation, the place where President Anwar Sadat of Egypt will be getting what little rest he can while he's here in the next 42, 43 hours from the King David Hotel. This is Alan Benami returning you to the studio in Jerusalem. The nation's mood was one of stunned disbelief. Many of the daily papers carried banner headlines in Arabic for the first time. Alan Wasalan, welcome. One editorial was headed by Hebrew slogan, which recalled the heady days just after the Six-Day War. Hainu kachol mim. We were as dreamers. The moment we uh, opened the airplane doors, uh, facing the Israelis down there, uh, we both stood facing each other, both of us really unbalanced and unbelieving, 
that it's really happening. Just a short while ago, you landed in Israel. There was a reception at the airport. There were crowds lining your route here to Jerusalem. What was your reaction to all this? I did not expect that we should be received so warmly here. The people were coming by themselves and uh, hailing us and uh, greeting us in a very friendly way. More than we expected, much more. You feel it's a good sign for the future? Yes, it's a very good sign. Let's hope for peace. You have family in Cairo? Yes, of course. When you get back, what, what are you going to tell them? I'll try to let them get the picture because I'm sure their imagination would never get to the point of uh, knowing what's really going on. What is really going on? <laughs> really, I can't, I can't say. I, know I, I, I can't give an opinion about that because I, I haven't digested it yet. I'll tell you something, uh, sitting together like this and speaking, I'm an uh, Egyptian and you're an Israeli, uh, talking together, I think it's be much, much more better than fighting together. How do you and the other members of the delegation react to the welcome that you've been given here in Israel? Did it surprise you at all? No, it didn't surprise me because I know about your hospitality very well. Uh, what really struck me is the Israeli public. The Israeli public is really looking for peace. And uh, I think this is a positive uh, step because the Israeli public, when we come to them and say we want peace, it's just peace, I think we will have the support of the Israeli public. What is your feeling now when we are speaking? I am an Israeli reporter and you are an Egyptian reporter speaking in Jerusalem. Uh, I'm happy now because I'm here, but the, I'll be more happy when the negotiations between President Sadat and the Israeli heads will come to the peace, inshallah. Inshallah, God willing. And all over the city, the microphones were thrusting, the television floodlights glaring, and the cameras maneuvering for close-ups. Focus, naturally, on Prime Minister Biggin and on President Sadat. A successful visit for both sides, for uh, President Sadat personally, and for the country he represents, and for Israel. A new atmosphere was created between the two countries. An atmosphere of better understanding, I suppose a measure of cooperation, and first of all of a dialogue, a direct dialogue between the two countries for which we looked for so many years. The foundation for such a dialogue was laid here in Jerusalem, and we agreed to continue. That is the main point. The dialogue will be continued. Finally, sir, are you optimistic for the future? Do you feel real? I am. I am indeed. How are the talks with Prime Minister Begin? We didn't really start uh, uh, our talks. Uh, we had. We have yesterday had a, 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 I mean, a small session after I arrived in the hotel. Do you think, Mr. President, that peace is now about to reach the Middle East? Well, I'm always optimistic. You must have heard me. I'm optimistic by nature. I share the president's optimism. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, God is great. On Sunday morning, President Sadat was up at the crack of dawn for prayers marking Eid al-Adha, the Feast of the Sacrifice commemorating Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his son to the Lord, Abraham, the common forefather of both Jews and Muslims. President Anwar Sadat was welcomed warmly by the hundreds of worshippers at the Al-Aqsa Mosque this morning. Sadat, a devout Muslim, appeared to be delighted at being able to pray at the second holiest mosque in Islam. Smiling broadly, he waved to a crowd of onlookers and then embraced Muslim religious leaders at the entrance to the mosque. The cheering and chanting by the worshippers swelled as Sadat removed his shoes and entered. The mosque itself was not completely filled. Security measures were tight, very tight. Anyone approaching the Temple Mount was given a close body search. Israeli border police were out in force and barriers kept the spectators at a distance as Sadat entered the mosque. The 40 minute service passed quietly, but then at its end, the hundreds of worshippers inside surged forward, chanting. They are shouting Palestine, Palestine, Sadat. For several minutes, it looked as if President Sadat might be mobbed by the worshippers. From Al-Aqsa, Sadat and his party then made its way to the nearby Dome of the Rock and later to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. 
That same morning, a pilgrimage of a different kind. The Egyptian president visits Yad Vashem, Israel's memorial to the six million Jews annihilated in the Nazi Holocaust of World War II. A helicopter flies overhead and police, border police and soldiers man all strategic points. Just after 11 o'clock, the motorcade arrives. President Sadat, flanked by Prime Minister Begin and Knesset member Gidon Hausner, walks slowly along the avenue of the righteous Gentiles. Plaques honor those who risked their lives to save Jews from the Nazi clutches. Then to the Holocaust Museum, where Gidon Hausner explained. This is a plan of Auschwitz, where they were exterminating 10,000 human beings per day. These were the best Jews. These are the crematoriums. They proceed to the Hall of Names, which contains biographical details supplied by surviving relatives of Holocaust victims. Two million such pages of testimony have so far been recorded. Before the eternal flame over the mosaic floor bearing the names of the largest camps, Sadat stands at attention. He reveals no emotion. Afterwards, I asked an Egyptian journalist, Adel Badrawi, what he felt walking through Yad Vashem. Terrible, a terrible picture for the Jews who were killed by uh, the Nazi. I uh, have a very bad uh, uh, feeling for what happened. Do you think it, it helps you understand perhaps the mentality of the Israelis better than before? Yes, I think so. Yes, I, 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 uh, I felt... Uh, I felt that, uh, that uh, the Israelis suffered from the Nazi, from the Second War, and, uh, and what happened to them in this war. War, the recurring tragedy of the Middle East. Peace, for which Anwar Sadat was ready to come to Jerusalem. Our reporter spoke with leading members of the Egyptian delegation. The war is taking a lot of the budget, about 25% of the gross national product of Egypt is spent uh, in war. It is too much from the country. We must have peace. Because we have been fighting now 30 years ago. It's too much. How many billions? Over 40 billion dollars have been spent in Israel, Egypt, and the Arab countries in the last 20 years. How much this 40 billion could do for the economy of this area? This area is very sensitive, and you know that. Throughout the Arab world, there has been tremendous criticism of President Sadat's decision to come here to Israel. There have been riots and demonstrations. Today in Syria, a day of mourning has been pronounced because of the visit. How do you feel about this, sir? Maybe the Arab countries did not expect such initiative to come so quickly. And usually, when we hear something like this for the first time, some people are astonished, some are amazed. But I think later they will follow us and they will believe that Sadat has done something Wonderful, not to Egypt, not to the Arabs, but for the whole world. Musa Sabri, editor of the Egyptian paper Al Akbar, what do you feel can come out of these two, three days here in Jerusalem where Egyptian leaders and Israeli leaders will be meeting and talking? What can we expect, do you think? You see, uh, this depends on the reaction of uh, the Israeli leaders and the Israeli people. Because the first step and the historical step, it is already taken by President Sadat. Everybody is afraid from the each other. You don't, you don't trust us, we don't trust you. All right, President Sadat is opening a new page in our relations of trust and friendship, you see, and peace and love. And that's why I'm telling you, we are waiting for your reaction. Anna de Boschgrave, we're sitting here in the lobby of the King David Hotel in Jerusalem, waiting for an event which has virtually taken the world completely by surprise. But not you, you say. Why? Well, because uh, if you recall, in January of 71, I did the first interview with Sadat after he had succeeded NASA. And at that time, as we were talking and chatting before the actual interview, he said uh, that he had two options. One was to continue the NASA legacy, which he felt was the road to political and economic bankruptcy. And the other option was to become the Willy Brandt of the Arab world. And when I asked what that meant, he said, well, sooner or later there will be a leader in the Arab world who will learn to live and recognize uh, the reality of Israel. And uh, at first that leader will be reviled and despised and hated, but eventually he'll go down in history as a great man. And there was little doubt in my mind from that moment on that he wanted to go down in history as that man. 
So that said this would happen sooner or later, and he said that six years ago. Is this the sooner or is it later than it could have taken place? Why now? What are the circumstances which make it possible now, do you think? I think it was possible, and he was willing to stick his neck out and do it in January of 71, when in that same interview I just referred to, he said, I am willing to sign a formal, final peace agreement with the State of Israel. Provided, of course, Israel returns to the 67 borders and uh, that we uh, settle the Palestinian issue. But that was the first time any Arab leader had said that. And it was a bombshell around the world. Unfortunately, former Prime Minister Golda Meir, when I came here to get her response, uh, laughed at it and said, surely you don't take those kind of things seriously, do you? And I said, yes, I do. And as a matter of fact, uh, Shimon Peres, when he read the Newsweek interview, he couldn't believe what he was reading, and he said, Golda Meir has a historic opportunity to respond in kind, not give anything away, but just change the climate of the whole dialogue. And uh, after Shimon Peres read the text of the Golda Meir reply, he was very sadly disappointed, and he said, I'm afraid she has blown this opportunity. It was, as we have said, a field day for the news media. Israel Broadcasting interviewed Newsweek, Cairo Radio interviewed Israel Broadcasting and vice versa, and on television, the two stars sat side by side for a friendly chat with America's million dollar moderator, Barbara Walters. Would you like to give us your personal uh, feelings about the Prime Minister? Uh, in the first place, I uh, 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 knew him uh, uh, through uh, President Carter, and then after that, uh, through uh, President Ceausescu. And uh, yesterday, President Katsia was telling me about him on our way from the aerodrome to the hotel here. As you can see, Barbara, I have, thank God, the recommendations of three presidents. <laughs> Two presidents. Uh, Not as I said, president. this is my feeling. We really like each other. We may have differences, but we like each other. So that there might be a ray of light, there might be some concession, there might be a somewhat different position down the road. <laughs> uh, you are always like this. <laughs> <laughs> this is what people are going to be asking. Roger. Politics can, can can't be conducted like this. Like this. <laughs> I have to keep trying. Now it's clear that we have difference of opinion, but free men have them. We should sit together, talk here, any other place. And as history proves, first they start with difference of opinion. <coughs> and sometimes there are dramatic events in the smoke-filled room. Now, I wouldn't like now, uh, when we sit together, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, emphasize the differences we have. We have them. Mm -hmm. But let us talk about it. Let us negotiate. You don't uh, properly well, may I say, exceptionally well, conduct negotiations on television. Maybe you don't conduct negotiations on television, but that's what influences the man in the street. No, I just think it's kind of strange uh, watching Sadat come into Israel. I'm kind of in shock. After all, I spent two weeks in the army doing reserve duty, and then uh, three or four days later he shows up in Israel. And I just thought maybe we won't have to do reserve duty anymore. But I doubt it. I see Sadat's visit as a definite step towards peace. Um, well, because he has taken the step to come forward, and um, I hope something will come out of it. Now we put everything at the stake. So it really depends uh, what's going to happen in the next uh, couple of days and a uh, couple of months. Also depends on what's going to happen in the Arab world, how they're going to take this. I just don't trust the whole thing. Trust or not, the mood in Jerusalem was, to put it mildly, optimistic. The late night bulletin went off the air with an unusual tailpiece and an even more unusual weather report. The first Israeli bank account was tonight officially opened in Cairo by Knesset member Shmuel Flutter Sharon. A cable he received tonight from the National Bank of Abu Dhabi, Cairo, said they were pleased with his decision and were sending him the administrative documents to open the account. And the weather, it'll be clear and cool tonight, tomorrow clear and dry, the temperatures for tonight and tomorrow, Jerusalem 8 to 22, Tel Aviv 12 to 26, Golan Heights 9 to 23, Beersheba and Northern Sinai 8 to 27, Eilat and Southern Sinai from 14 to 29, and in Cairo from 11 tonight going up to 25 degrees centigrade tomorrow. 
President Anwar Sadat was quite specific about his aims in coming to Jerusalem. He explained them to Walter Cronkite and to the entire world. The only condition is that I want to discuss the whole situation with the 120 members of the Knesset and put the full picture from our point of view. The full picture was as strange and surprising as was the entire visit. Twelve flags are flying in the breeze, six blue and white Israeli flags, and six Egyptian flags, red, white, and black. In the main forecourt, three large flagpoles. An Israeli flag is flying together with the emblem of Israel, and on the third mast, an Egyptian flag, which is now being slowly raised in the presence of Egypt's president. The Knesset Guard is now presenting arms as the military band plays its salute. And Anwar Sadat will now inspect the honor guard of Knesset guards. He walks slowly forward. Now he turns and faces them. President Sadat, accompanied by President Katsir, slowly move forward to the flame of Israel's unknown soldier. Two Knesset guards present President Sadat with a wreath of red and white flowers decorated with two Egyptian flags. Sadat moves forward, lays the wreath. He now pauses, then steps back, and is now standing rigidly at attention. He looks straight ahead at the wreath he has just placed. And then President Sadat and his party turn slowly and make their way to the entrance of the Knesset itself. It is now four o'clock on Sunday the 20th of November, 1977. And here in Israel's parliament, the Knesset, President Anwar Sadat is taking his seat with thunderous applause. And President Sadat is smiling gently at the audience in front of him. If two weeks ago, Enaria told me that I would be sitting in Israel's parliament to watch a speech by the president of Egypt, well, one could have imagined my reaction, but here it is, the speech by Anwar Sadat to Israel's parliament. The speaker of the Knesset, Israel's parliament, opens with quotations from the Bible appropriate to the occasion. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not live up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. In the spirit of the prophet, I welcome you all, and our very distinguished guest, the president of the Egyptian Arab Republic, Muhammad Anwar Asadat. Bismillah, Sayyid Rais al Knesset, Ayyuh al Sayyidat, Wassad. Smahuli awalan an atawagga. President Sadat spoke in Arabic and at length. His main object in coming to Jerusalem, he said, was to break down the barriers of fear and suspicion between the two peoples. He spoke of Israel's right to exist in the Middle East, about international guarantees, and reiterated the demands that Israel withdraw from all areas occupied since the Six-Day War, and that a homeland be established for the Palestinian Arabs. A parliamentary house rule had been specially amended so that Knesset members could applaud. 
אדוני היושב-ראש, אדוני נשיאה של מדינת ישראל, אדוני נשיאה של הרפובליקה הערבית של מצרים, מוריי ורבותיי חברי הכנסת. Prime Minister Begin responded in Hebrew. After relating the long history of suffering and exile of the Jewish people, which had ultimately brought about the return to Zion, while stressing the differences that exist in the viewpoints of the two countries, he stated that Israel was open to all citizens of Egypt and called upon Syria, Jordan and Lebanon to come and discuss their differences in Jerusalem. Prime Minister Begin was followed by Shimon Peres, the leader of the opposition. It was a ceremonial session and there was no debate. This historic session of the Knesset is closed. Both main speeches were fairly hard line, each in its own way. Both immediately aroused questions. You're disappointed after the speeches in the Knesset today, are you? Well, disappointment is not the right description. I think that the only thing that was not surprising in, during this visit, everything was surprising except uh, the speeches. Salman Shuval, what is your evaluation of the speeches given this afternoon? Well, I think uh, the most important fact uh, still remains the very visit of Sadat to Israel and perhaps the, uh, the symbolic handshake between the two leaders. I can only hope that the things which were said in public today, both by President Sadat and Prime Minister Begin, are really only the tip of the iceberg and that more is perhaps going on behind the scenes uh, than we know at the present time. I'm talking now to Yosef Rosen, the man whose words, the English translation of the speeches went out through the entire world. Now you've translated speeches by many, many people all over the world. Just how difficult is the presence of that a man to translate? Well, he spoke very clearly and understanding good Arabic, something which cannot be said for quite a number of speakers whom I shall not mention by name. Simple sentences, simple words, I wish many radio commentators, not to mention Knesset speakers, learned from him, took a leaf out of his book. The following day, President Sadat was at the Knesset again, this time for a series of meetings with the party leadership of all the various factions that make up the Israeli political mosaic. These meetings are also broadcast in simultaneous translation where necessary. Sadat is smiling. He's being addressed by the secretary of the Likud faction in the uh, government uh, coalition. All Arab nations, he says, can afford to lose a war, but Israel cannot afford to lose a single battle. And this is uh, Gil Cohen, uh, also from the Likud. We saw you standing to attention to the sound of our national anthem, Hatikva. The last time Hatikva was held in Cairo was in 1945, when uh, Jewish fighters were hanged uh, by orders of the British. Uh, don't you think there are mutual interests of the two nations against a common enemy, British imperialism? And today there is red imperialism. And so the common enemy of today is trying to prevent us getting to understanding with Egypt. Don't you think that if a Palestinian state arises here, it will be a primary base for red imperialism? On the other hand, the strong land of Israel will be a base for peace. As I said yesterday, we are ready and we have no objection to whatever measures can be agreed upon to provide you with full security. The October war should be the last war. And now President Sadat is headed for another meeting with the opposition faction, the Ma'arach, the Labour Alignment. Yitzhak Navon is speaking in Arabic. And we hope that we in this area, Jews and Arabs, 
will heal the wounds that the conflict has left in us. Let us work together for a better tomorrow. Peace be upon you and the mercy of God. President Sadat is seated between Shimon Peres and uh, Golda Meir, and he applauded the Yitzhak Navon speech. A few remarks from former Prime Minister of Israel, Yitzhak Rabin. When we talk about defendable boundaries, allow me to say, Mr. President, I was the Chief of Staff of the Armed Forces of Israel prior to the 67 war. I don't want any future Chief of Staff to face what I had to face prior to this war. This is Mrs. Golda Meir, ex-Prime Minister of Israel. When asked many years ago, when do I think peace will come to this region, to our country and our neighboring countries, I said, the date, I do not know. But I know under what conditions it will come. When there will be a leader, a great leader of an Arab country, or he will wake up one morning and feel sorry for his own people, for his own sons that have fallen in battle, that day will be the beginning of peace between us and them. Mr. President, we do not want to be shot at, and believe me, we do not want to shoot. And Mr. President, as a grandmother to a grandfather, <laughs> may, <laughs> may I give you a little present thank for you. the new granddaughter. Thank and you, thank man. you for your present that you have given me. And a round of applause for President Anwar Sadat. As he leaves the meeting with the opposition Labour faction of Israel's parliament. This was, of course, his prime request in uh, coming to Israel to meet with what he defined as the 120 elected deputies of the state of Israel. President Sadat is now shaking hands. He's surrounded by well-wishers. Former CNC Chaim Bar-Lev is uh, now shaking his hand. Uh, Chaim Bar-Lev, whose line, of course, was crossed by Anwar Sadat's forces in uh, the October war. And they're now making their way out of the Knesset building. The next destination is the press conference at the uh, International Communication Center set up in the Jerusalem Theater, in which a joint statement is expected from both President Anwar Sadat of Egypt and Prime Minister Menachem Begin of Israel. The two leaders of Israel and Egypt began their joint news conference with this statement read out by Israel's Prime Minister Menachem Begin. With the permission of the President, our noble guest, I'll read to you, ladies and gentlemen, an agreed communique issued at the conclusion of the visit to our country of President Sadat. In response to the sincere and courageous move by President Sadat, and believing in the need to continue the dialogue along the lines proposed by both sides during their exchanges and the presentation of the positions in the historic meeting in Jerusalem, and in order to enhance the prospect of a fruitful consummation of this significant visit, the government of Israel, expressing the will of the people of Israel, proposes that this hopeful step be further pursued through dialogue between the two countries concerned, thereby paving the way towards successful negotiations leading to the signing of peace treaties in Geneva with all the neighboring Arab states. May I ask for your questions? How do you continue a dialogue without an Israeli ambassador in Cairo and an Egyptian ambassador in Jerusalem, or how will you do it practically? Well, uh, the establishment of diplomatic relations usually goes together with the signing of peace treaties. In our case, I suppose it will be logical to have diplomatic relations established as an integral part of the peace treaty, which in God's good time we hope to sign. 
Mr. President, why aren't you inviting the Prime Minister of Israel to visit Cairo on this stage? After I was invited here and after I uh, addressed the Knesset and the Israeli people through the Knesset, the Prime Minister has got the full right to come and address our parliament there in Cairo. But for certain reasons that we discussed together, we have found uh, that uh, uh, we postpone this issue for the future. Did you feel a little bit embarrassed by the fact that you had to postpone the invitation of Mr. Begin to Cairo? <laughs> I am not embarrassed. <laughs> a very sly... Uh, <laughs> Either I'm uh, an Arab and hospitable or not. <laughs> no. Uh, uh, as I said before, we have discussed this, uh, Premier Begin and me, and we agreed together to postpone it for the time being. I would like to add one remark. I will say to the questioner and to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, that during the visit of President Sadat to our country and to Jerusalem, a momentous agreement was achieved already, namely, no more war, no more bloodshed, no more attacks, and collaboration in order to avoid any event which may lead to such tragic developments. Claude Smadra, Swiss TV. I have two questions for Mr. Begin and Mr. Sadat. First, after all your talks, are you now both convinced of the sincerity of the desire for peace of each of you. Second question, did you fix a date for the reconvening of the Geneva Conference? For the first question, yes. Uh, for the second question, we shall be working in the very near future for uh, the reconvening of Geneva Conference. For the first question, yes. And we shall together work for the reconvening of the Geneva Conference. <laughs> Peter Snow, British Independent Television News. You have faced very strong attacks from much of the rest of the Arab world for your visit here. You've even been faced with the threat of assassination for what you've done. What do you say to these people? I shall not be saying anything to those people. I think I shall be uh, telling my people in Egypt what has happened here. I shall be uh, uh, giving a speech before the parliament after my arrival, I need not uh, answer all those who have attacked. Let me remind you that after the second disengagement agreement, and for one continual year, I was much more vehemently attacked, rather than, than the attacks now. Is vanity to win territory more important? Two words only for my answer. Our land is sacred. My friend, and if you ask me a question about security, I will explain... No, the question was about territory, sir, not security. Would you please allow me to reply? Okay. Thank you for your permission. <laughs> I can respect a statement made just now by President Sadat. Our land is sacred. And because I respect that statement, may I say, our land is sacred. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, may I seize this opportunity really to thank uh, Premier Begin, to thank the Israeli people, President Katsir, for the very warm welcome that was accorded to me here. We are in a crucial moment. Let us hope, all of us, that we can keep the momentum and may God guide the steps of Premier Begin and the Knesset because there is a great need for hard and drastic decisions. All the best wishes for 
my friend Premier Begin and his family, and all my deep gratitude to the Israeli people whose welcome I shall never forget. Thank you. President Sadat and Prime Minister Begin are shaking hands warmly, and they are now being escorted from the speaker's podium. The journalists are trying to get their shorts, packing up their cameras, and gradually dispersing. Two hours later, shortly before sunset, all was ready for takeoff. President Sadat, accompanied by Mr. Begin and President Katsia, approaches the two chief rabbis of Israel who are standing at the end of the first line here at Ben Gurion Airport on the tarmac. There's still an air of excitement here at 10, sir, but perhaps a little calmer than it was two days ago. President Sadat has arrived. He has already made history. Mr. Begin and Mr. Sadat are both smiling. President Sadat is just a few meters in front of me and shaking hands with Mrs. Golda Meir. They're both smiling. I can't hear what they're saying, but Mrs. Meir looks very, very moved. And now it's Yitzhak Rabin's turn. It's getting a bit cold here as the sun is going down and the wind is flicking the flags of Egypt and of the state of Israel, pulling them out almost to full extent in the breeze. Now, President Anwar Sadat of Egypt, having said goodbye to the Israeli government and dignitaries, is moving towards the end of the red carpet. Now, President Sadat is going up the steps into the airliner which is waiting to take him back to Cairo. He turns, raises his hand, and greets the crowd, bowing to the crowd, to the assembled guests and dignitaries as the band gives another fanfare. President Anwar Sadat, the first Arab leader ever to visit Israel, standing to attention on the steps of the plane, the red, white, and black plane, which will take him back to Egypt. Suddenly, it was all over. The red carpet was rolled up and sent off to be dry cleaned. The flags were stored away for possible further use. People were trying to sum up what it had all meant. Deputy Premier Yigal Yadin. We should be very careful in our expectations from immediate uh, solutions for all these uh, uh, questions which for 30 years were, it was not possible uh, to solve them. I would say at first we have to talk and see what can be done, and if can be done, between our position against the Palestinian state, against going back to 67, against the PLO as such, participating because it is uh, also connected, and the Egyptian or the Arab position. And I believe when there is a will, there should be a way as well. As long as we talk, and we really talk frankly, we must find a solution, because if we come to the conclusion that even if we talk directly there is no solution, then that will be a very sad uh, conclusion. But it doesn't mean that we can tackle this problem and talk within days or weeks. Uh, even if it will have to take time, one should not uh, be pessimistic. Our reporter Andrew Mizell spoke with a man who, but for the still recent elections, might have been the one to greet President Sadat on this historic visit. Former Defence Minister, former candidate for the post of Prime Minister, now leader of the opposition, Shimon Peres. Mr. Peres, most of Israel is still in a mood of euphoria over this visit. You, of course, were a great deal closer to the visit than the average Israeli. What is your mood? I think there is reason for a special mood. It was a moving occasion. It was a day that we have awaited 30 years, finally, an Arab leader came over here to the parliament, to Jerusalem, spoke on peace with great courage and dignity. It is a great occasion. I think never before was the Middle East as open for a meaningful negotiation. And there is a new opening. And by God, we shouldn't miss it.
44 hours in Jerusalem. This record was compiled from actuality material broadcast by the English language newsroom. Sound engineer Shabbatai Bibi, your reporter Ruven Morgan. This is Israel broadcasting from Jerusalem.